First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, they asked me to talk about uh, a recent paper I did in collaboration with Joel Geet, uh, where we, um, well, basically try to find a new formulation of 3dn equals 4 super Yang mills on a lattice. Uh, let me just begin with some uh, very basic motivation. Uh, first of all, it's interesting to consider uh, three-dimensional gauge theories uh, because, um, first of all, they're asymptotically free, uh, but they're also super renormalizable, and so one can think of them in some sense as a toy model for four-dimensional QCD. And, uh, for example, uh, it's well known uh, that uh, if you take uh, Yang-Mills theory and you couple it to adjoint scalars, it's a good approximation to four-dimensional QCD at high temperatures. Uh, but in this talk, I'm actually going to be talking about a uh, supersymmetric version of that, notably a half-maximal uh, super Yang-Mills theory in three dimensions. And that comes from the dimensional reduction of 4D n equals 2 super Yang-Mills, uh, which also exhibits a very rich uh, non-perturbative structure, as exhibited in, uh, by the cyberg witten solution. And furthermore, uh, 3D n equals 4 theories are interesting in their own right, uh, because... Uh, well, uh, they exhibit something known as uh, mirror symmetry, uh, which relates uh, two, two uh, 3D theories uh, which flow to the same IR fixed point. And I guess the, the bottom line is that because um, lattice gauge theory provides some non-perturbative definition uh, of, of quantum field theory, uh, it seems like a, like a promising approach to um, studying uh, the, these symmetries and, and non-perturbative, well, th these dualities and non-perturbative non phenomena um, more deeply. Uh, so broadly speaking, uh, there are two um, approaches uh, to formulating uh, supersymmetry on a lattice uh, that we heard about earlier this week. Uh, one comes from orbifolding uh, matrix models. Another one comes from topologically twisting and then... Uh, performing a geometric discretization. And uh, these constructions uh, can describe theories uh, in, in, in a dimension d less than or equal to 4, uh, which, have, which have an integer multiple of 2 to the d supercharges in the continuum limit. So in particular, uh, in four dimensions, you see right away that the only theory that you can re reach in, in this approach uh, is one with 16 supercharges, notably uh, with maximal supersymmetry. Once you go to three dimensions, for example, uh, you can have eight supercharges or 16 supercharges. And, um, and, and if you go to lower dimensions, you, you have even, even more possibilities. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to actually um, pursue uh, this, this topological twisting approach uh, in, in this talk. So, so what I'd like to do is actually start off with kind of a historical motivation for it, uh, which will actually be very practical from my point of view because it'll actually be the starting point um, for um, going to 3dn equals 4 uh, on, on a lattice. So as far as I know, uh, the, the idea of topologically twisting uh, was, was first developed by Witten, uh, who, who had, whose motivation, I think, was, was to understand supersymmetric quantum field theory on, on general smooth manifolds uh, with, with uh, I, I think, the, the goal of proving uh, certain uh, topological invariance, uh, well, of, of deriving certain topological of, uh, invariance of these manifolds from a physical point of view. Um, but of course, uh, one, once you go away from flat space, uh, generically, uh, supersymmetry will be broken, which you can easily see if you look at the killing spinner equation. Uh, and, and, and the point is that, that uh, the way to, to fix that is, is to compensate the breaking of space, oh, well, the breaking of supersymmetry by space-time curvature uh, with R symmetry curvature, or, or put another way, you, you have to somehow identify some subgroup of the Lorentz group with some subgroup of, of the R symmetry group, and that, in a, in a nutshell, is, is what twisting is. Uh, so, so for the specific case of 4dn equals 2 super Yang mills, uh, you start off by thinking about what the global symmetries are, uh, and, and those correspond to an SU2 left times SU2 right, which are locally uh, the 4d Lorentz group, uh, as well as an SU2 R symmetry, uh, and a U1 R symmetry, which has a six-dimensional origin. You can think of this U1 as sort of a, a, a rotation in the two-dimensional plane that's orthogonal to the six, uh, that's orthogonal to the four spatial dimensions when you dimensionally reduce from 60 to 40. And uh, then, then the twist uh, basically amounts to uh, 
taking the diagonal subgroup of this SU2R, which comes from the Lorentz group, with this SU2 uppercase R, which comes from the R symmetry. Uh, okay, and after performing this twist, uh, the, the fields uh, in the theory look like this. So, so the bosonic fields consist of a gauge field A mu, uh, two scalars phi and phi bar, uh, where phi bar is taken to be the permission conjugate of, of phi. Uh, and, and one slightly unusual uh, feature of twisted theories is that the fermions no, long, no longer have spinner indices. Uh, rather, they have vector indices. So they, or, or they, they, so they can transform into scalars, vectors, or, or two forms, for example. And uh, this, this uh, two form, uh, chi mu nu, uh, is, is self dual. Okay? And, and uh, furthermore, what, what Witten showed is that the uh, Lagrangian for the theory can be written in this uh, very uh, intriguing form, uh, which, which looks like, like the theory has some kind of a BRST symmetry, uh, and where the first term is, what is BRST exact, and the second term is BRST closed, uh, where the BRST transformation uh, acts on the fields in, in, in the following way. Uh, I guess really the key point to take away from these um, tra transformations uh, is that first of all, Q squared to a gauge transformation. Uh, so for that reason, when I hit the first term with a Q, that gives me a Q squared of something uh, that's being traced, which is a gauge invariant, and so the gauge transformation of a gauge invariant is zero, so, so it becomes clear that the first term is Q exact. And the second term is, becomes Q, is Q closed uh, by the Bianchi identity, because uh, when I hit F with, with Q, that basically gives me a covariant derivative acting on Psi, uh, and and then, then you can just do an integration by parts, and, and then you'll get uh, basically uh, df mu nu, which vanishes. And, and so uh, ultimately, um, the fact that you have some nilpotent supersymmetry uh, in, in, in this formulation, uh, well, ultimately uh, led, led Witten to understand that somehow, uh, at least when you restrict uh, to the BRST cohomology, uh, the theory is, is insensitive to, to uh, local geometry. There are no local, tran uh, there are no local tran um, translations. And so, so it's only really sensitive to the topology of the manifold, and that's what, what allowed him somehow to derive these topological invariants from a uh, physical standpoint. Uh, but, but the point is that this idea is actually far more powerful than that. And as was explained by uh, Simon Catterall uh, earlier in, in the week, uh, it, it can also be thought of as the starting point for formulating uh, supersymmetry on a lattice. And uh, in, in fact, uh, for, for the, this particular model, 4dn equals 2 super Young mills, uh, a lattice formulation based on, on the Donaldson Witten twist uh, was proposed by uh, Sugino. Although he didn't use the geometric discretization approach uh, that I'm going to discuss in, in this talk. And, um, and, and so, once you apply geometric discretization, you find that, that I think the, the, uh, the final theory you end up with is quite different. Uh, ultimately, uh, what, what uh, you find if you, use uh, if you use the geometric discretization is that uh, the lattice theory can't live in four dimensions, rather it has to live in three dimensions or less. So, uh, let, let me uh, temp temporarily go back to thinking about three dimensions. And, and uh, if we want to perform some kind of analogous twist in 3dn equals 4 super Young mills, we have to uh, consider what the global symmetries are. In this case, it's SU2E, uh, which you can think of as sort of the rotation group in, in three dimensions. And then you have two R symmetry groups. This SU2R you can think of as coming from the dimensional reduction uh, from 4dn equals 2. And this SU2N you can think of as the analog of that U1R symmetry in four dimensions. In other words, this SU2N has some six-dimensional origin. You can think of it as sort of the rotations in, in the three-dimensionals orthogonal to this three-dimensional, well, these three internal directions when, when you dimensionally reduce. And then there, there are two types of twists that you can perform. Uh, one was obtained by Blau and Thompson, and that corresponds to taking the diagonal subgroup of, of the rotation group with this internal SU2. Uh, and the other one I'll, I'll just refer to as the Donaldson-Witten twist, again corresponds to taking uh, an SU2 of, of, uh, of, of the Lorentz group, well, sorry, the ro of the rotation group, and, and taking the diagonal uh, subgroup of that with, with the SU2 R symmetry group. And then, uh, yes, sure. 
Do you know whether after the twist uh, this theory still uh, respects uh, mirror symmetry? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, the answer is I don't know. Uh, I, I think somehow, uh, m well, when you, have, when you add in a sufficient number of flavors, uh, mirror symmetry is, is well understood. Uh, but for the case of just pure, well, just 3D n equals 4 super angles, I don't think it's well understood. It's tempting, it's tempting to say that somehow uh, this, this theory is mapped under, into itself under mirror symmetry, in, and, and it sort of exchanges the two twists. Uh, but but I, I don't really know. Right, because in, under mirror symmetry, the two SU2s... Indeed, indeed. Kind so, of swap. So, yes, I, so I think it it's, could be that, the two's, that in the other, the mirror, the, the twist is kind of... Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. That's right, yeah, and that was actually one of the underlying motivations for sort of, um, for, you know, stu studying, the, uh, well, trying to latticize 3 to n equals 4 in, in this way. Uh, because, it, in fact, a lattice formulation based on the Blout-Thompson twist uh, was obtained by uh, Anash Joseph uh, a few years ago, uh, but but I don't think the one corresponding to the Donaldson Witten twist uh, was well understood, and and uh, I think it's interesting to consider the the the, the Donaldson Witten twist uh, because uh, generically when you go to the Coulomb branch, uh, this SU2n will be broken, and and that's the SU2n that that uh, participates in the Blau Thompson twist whereas the SU2R symmetry is preserved. And, and so for that reason, uh, it may be conceptually, or at least somehow technically uh, useful uh, to consider uh, a twist that, that leaves the SU2N untouched. Uh, okay, very good. So, so now I'm gonna go back to four dimensions uh, with, with this three-dimensional story in mind. And um, because I wanna apply geometrical, uh, geometric discretization, uh, it turns out uh, that, that you have to complexify the theory somehow. So, so uh, we, we just sort of did a, you know, a, 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 well, a naive complexification uh, where we take phi bar and to be no longer equal to phi dagger. So now we consider them to be sort of two independent fields. Uh, and now uh, the Hodge duality on, on chi is slightly more general. In this case, it relates chi to its complex conjugate. And moreover, uh, we also allow, you know, the fermionic field psi mu and eta uh, to be complexified. And then uh, it's not difficult to see that if you just generalize um, the, the uh, nilpotent supersymmetry of, of, of Witten's formulation in, in the following simple way, uh, then, then you can just get some kind of complexification of, of uh, the 4dn equals 2 theory that, again, uh, can be reformulated as a topological theory. But uh, as I said, that uh, w w one, one big difference between this approach and, and the one uh, used, used by Sugino is that um, when you uh, actually try to put this thing on a lattice, we'll find uh, that it has to live uh, in, in less than four dimensions. And, and the basic reason is that, that we'll find that this Hodge duality constraint on the two-form chi is only compatible uh, with lattice gauge symmetry. Uh, and at most three dimensions. And this is very reminiscent, I guess, of, of the story for 4D lattice n equals four super angles, where again, one starts in five dimensions and then somehow lattice gauge symmetry forces the theory to live in fewer dimensions. So this is somehow the three-dimensional analog of that, I would say. Good, so, so how do you define the lattice fields? Well, uh, the scalars phi, phi bar, and the fermionic scalar eta uh, will, resi will uh, reside on the lattice sites where these, uh, it, and mu's are integers on some abstract lattice, uh, which is, I think, what the computer would see. Whereas this uh, n without an index on it, uh, which is some linear combination of these lattice basis vectors you think of as some point in a space-time lattice. And then we promote uh, the gauge field a mu to a Wilson line, which lives on a link running along the muth direction. Psi mu, again, is promoted to, to a link variable. And then chi mu nu is promoted to a link variable, but now it sort of uh, lives in a diagonal link. So in other words, it points in the e mu plus e nu direction. And uh, the complex conjugates are, are similar. It's just that they point in, they have the opposite orientation. Very good. And then, uh, well, okay, th there's another subtle point, which is uh, that, that these uh, link variables uh, in, in um, in contrast, the standard lattice QCD are non-compact. So you just think of these as n by n complex matrices. 
Uh, but but the uh, gauge symmetry of the lattice can can be uh, described in terms of of a un of an n by n unitary matrix, uh, where where it just acts on 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 the uh, on on the uh, field, lattice fields in 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 the in in, a, in in I guess the obvious way. Uh, so for example, uh, since the scalars reside at one one point. On the lattice, you, they just get they just transform as Gn on the left and G dagger on on the right. But since uh, the u mu's and psi mu's live on the links, well, one, one end of the link gets multiplied by uh, G of n, and then the other link end of the link gets multiplied by a G, but but uh, uh, evaluated at the other end of the link. Okay, and then uh, what one would like to do is formulate some kind of lattice analog of of the Hodge duality constraint. So uh, one one naive guess would be that it should take the following form, where delta is some finite vector on the lattice, which in the classical, well, in, in the continuum limit, should vanish, and, and then it's clear that this, you know, uh, an ansatz of this form uh, should should just describe the uh, complexified Hodge duality constraint I, I described before in the continuum limit. But then, uh, after if you stare at this for a few minutes, you realize that this type of ansatz is only consistent with, with these uh, lattice gauge transformations if this vector delta is equal to e mu plus e nu, and furthermore, if all of the um, uh, basis vectors of the lattice add, add up to zero. And so this is how you see that, that the theory, lattice theory has to live in at most three dimensions. Uh, you could try generalizing this ansatz, for example, by dressing it uh, with link variables, these u mu's, but that, as we'll see, would spoil uh, the Q invariance, because the U mu's transform non-trivially on, under uh, these these Q super well under these Q transformations, um, you could also say, well, okay, maybe maybe this complexification was misguided. Uh, maybe I should really just continue. Maybe, maybe the, the right type of constraint I should use uh, should be chi mu nu is equal to epsilon mu nu times chi mu nu again, not not as complex conjugate. But uh, then you'll see that there is no consistent solution in that case uh, with, with uh, lattice gauge invariance. So, so this, this seems to be, I think, fairly robust. Good. Uh, so so now, now uh, let's specify to three dimensions. And in that case, it's convenient uh, to choose the basis vectors uh, in, a, in, in the most symmetric way uh, to form what's called an A3 star lattice. Uh, you can think of these as, as the weight vectors of SU4 uh, in the fundamental representation. Or you could uh, just visualize them basically as corresponding to the uh, vertices of a tetrahedron centered at the origin, and uh, they, they uh, obey these these constraints. Um, and, and in general, if you want to generalize this A three star lattice to a higher something higher than three in A star d, all you have to do is change this one over four to one over, to one over d plus one, and you change this four to a d plus one. Okay, and then the point is that for this choice, uh, the, the lattice theory has an S4 point symmetry group, which is another, I think, advantage over uh, the lattice theory that one gets from the Blau-Thompson twist, which is intrinsically three-dimensional here. Because the lattice theory is somehow se secretly coming from four dimensions, it has a larger, has a larger symmetry. Uh, and, and, and that, of course, is, is, is useful uh, for constraining counter terms uh, in, in the quantum theory. Uh, and, and furthermore, uh, it's not difficult to see that the fields transform as reducible representations of the point symmetry group. And, and from that uh, observation, you can see somehow how, how the 3D fields emerge. For example, uh, the 4D gauge field can decompose into, into a 3D gauge field plus a scalar, which just corresponds to this S4 symmetric combination. And so in the end of the day, you have precisely the field content you would expect for 3D n equals 4 super n mills. Notably, uh, a 3D gauge field, uh, this... Uh, scalar field as well as the two scalar fields that, that I talked about earlier. So in, in total, you have three scalar fields and a 3D gauge field, which is precisely what you would want. But of course, all of these things are complexified. And then uh, to define the lattice theory, you, you just, uh, well, okay, I've been using this, this term geometric discretization over and over again. This is what I mean by it. Uh, basically, it means that you take covariant derivatives in the continuum limit and you replace them with forward or backward uh, difference, finite difference operators. And, um, okay, uh, this, this is what, what that looks like. And uh, then, then you can define the field strength in, in terms of this uh, discrete covariant derivative. 
And then it's not, it's not too difficult to see that with this definition of, of the covariant derivatives, if you look at the kinetic terms of the theory, uh, there are just no doublers. Very good. Uh, so, so now I'd like to show you what the Lagrangian for the lattice theory looks like, and this is it in its, its full glory. I admit this is, this is quite a bit to swallow. Uh, where, where this comes from is essentially starting from, from uh, the, uh, the twisted 4dn equals 2 theory uh, obtained by Witten, acting with Q and then writing out the full, the full Lagrangian. Uh, this term L chi just isolates the terms in the action that contain this uh, self-dual two-form fermion, chi and chi bar. Uh, and um, yeah, I don't know. This is, this is just, it, it looks kind of complicated at first. But the point is that actually it can be written in a much more compact form uh, if you first uh, compute the equations of motion for chi uh, and, and use that Hodge, lattice Hodge duality constraint. Uh, you find that they take take this uh, more reasonable looking form. And then if you take these equations of motion and plug them back in to the action, you see that it, uh, it, it um, collapses to a much more reasonable looking form that, that really mimics the complexified theory, uh, continuum theory that, that I showed you a few slides ago. Uh, so in fact, there's, there's a Q exact term and, and a Q closed term. And, and the, the action of, of this Q uh, charge on the lattice field is defined as follows. And, and I should emphasize that, that um, actually demonstrating the, the Q invariance of this Lagrangian is very non-trivial. And, and it relies in an essential way on the lattice being three-dimensional. And, and so let, let me just kind of quickly uh, review that. So, so first of all, the first thing you need to check is that the Hodge duality constraint on the lattice and, and, and the equations of motion for chi, which I plugged in, uh, are invariant under the Q supersymmetry. Uh, and indeed, once, when you plug in uh, these variations, you find that, that they very nicely are Q-invariant. And then the next thing you do is, is to uh, see how the lattice fields transform uh, when you hit them with Q-squared. And what you find after you use, you use the equations of motion for chi-bar that I showed you on an earlier slide is that they just reduce to uh, a gauge transformation, a lattice gauge transformation. And I, I write out what that looks like here uh, in case you're curious, although it's a, a little bit complicated. But then once you realize that, you see that, that, that this thing is Q-invariant for the same reason that, con that its continuum analog is. Notably, uh, this, when I hit this guy with Q, it gives me Q-squared of something that's gauge-invariant, which must vanish. And when I hit the second term with Q, uh, well, that just vanishes by uh, a lattice generalization of, of, of the Bianchi identity. And, and a very similar, similar type of manipulation is used uh, to show that the... Um, the lattice theory for 4D equals 4 superangles is, is, is um, Q invariant. Very good. So, so that's, that's sort of the uh, classical lattice theory. Uh, let, let me quickly uh, talk about, uh, well, make, make some comments about the renormalization of this theory. Uh, so so a, a big benefit of working in three dimensions, as I said, is that the theory is super renormalizable. And uh, as a result, uh, just using some dimensional analysis, you can see, for example, that marginal operators uh, induced by radiative corrections have to be uh, multiplied dimensionless, in this case, g a mil squared times the lattice spacing a. And so you can see that, that if you take a to zero, such corrections will vanish. And, and so you only need to consider relevant operators. Okay? Uh, but then after you rescale the fields uh, by g a mils, re recall, remembering that g a mils is dimensionful, it has mass dimension one half, so that you get canonical kinetic terms, you find that there are only four possible relevant operators that are consistent uh, with the symmetries of the lattice, notably lat eight, the Q, uh, the S4 point symmetry group, and also a certain shift symmetry on, on, on the uh, fermionic scalar. And then you observe that all of these allowed operators have mass dimension two. So again, using uh, dimensional analysis, you find that the radius corrections can only give rise to such terms at one loop. So, so this seems like, like a pretty, uh, pretty manageable task. Uh, to, to understand the renormalization of this theory. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the story gets a little bit more complicated uh, because uh, if you want to get the right continuum, well, if you want to have a sensible continuum limit, first of all, you have to add mass terms for the gauge fields uh, so, so that the covariant derivatives on, on the lattice will, will reduce to, to uh, covariant derivatives that, that can be um, sort of recognized as uh, 
as um, continuum covariant derivatives. But but the situation, I should say that such a mass term is also used uh, for, for, for lattice set equals four super Yang mills. But the situation is slightly worse in this case uh, because, uh, the, the, uh, because the theory is complexified. Uh, and, and, you know, one point of view is you could take is that the complexified theory is interesting in its own right, especially given some of the techniques that, that were mentioned at, at this workshop, like uh, the complex Langevin uh, equations. Um, but uh, if, if it's really the uncomplexified 3dn equals 4 super mills that you're after in the continuum limit, what you have to do uh, is add mass terms to decouple uh, the unwanted fields, notably the imaginary parts. Of, of the fields, and, and these mass terms will, will take the following form. For example, uh, for the scalar, uh, I, would, I would put in a mass term enforcing that the difference between phi dagger and phi bar uh, becomes massive so that uh, uh, effectively what this does is enforce that phi dagger is, is that phi bar is the complex conjugate of, of phi. Uh, but of course, in order to, to decouple these unwanted fields, you have to choose these masses to be rather large. Uh, in, or, or at least you have to choose them to be much larger than the dynamical scale of the theory, which, which you would expect is just uh, g ang mill squared. And I guess what, what's really uh, sort of not so elegant about this part of the story is that these mass terms um, break the lattice supersymmetry. But again, since we're working in three dimensions, uh, it's not terrible. I, I, I think what that means is that there will just be additional, uh, additional counter terms will be induced. Uh, by radiative corrections, but again, uh, it's, it's you know since we're working in three dimensions, uh, it's still a manageable task to understand these corrections. So so I'm now out of time. Uh, so let me just conclude. Uh, so so to summarize um, in in this talk, what I did was I I, I proposed a, a lattice formulation of 3dn equals four super Yang mills based on the Donaldson Witten twist, and the strategy was to complexify uh, the Donaldson Witten twist of, of 4dn equals two super Yang mills and then uh, apply geometric discretization. And then I think uh, one of the interesting things and maybe uh, surprising things that comes out of that uh, is, is some mechanism uh, for, of dimensional reduction where, where you find that, that compatibility of, of a Hodge duality constraint on a certain uh, fermionic field of, in, in, in the lattice theory uh, with lattice gauge invariance basically forces the theory to live uh, in three dimensions or less. Uh, but if you actually want to reach, be able to reach 3dn equals 4 super Yang mills in, in the continuum limit, what this means is that you have to add uh, mass terms which break uh, the, the, the uh, Q symmetry. Um, and and uh, so I think there are a number of interesting uh, future directions. So first of all, uh, it would be interesting to actually carry out in, in detail the perturbative renormalization of the theory. And, and after doing that, I think one will be in a good, good uh, position to start looking at numerical simulations and and sort of testing certain predictions of, of cyber witten theory dimensionally reduced to 3D. Uh, it would also be interesting to, and, and also things related to mirror symmetry, uh, in particular because in, in the case of just uh, pure 3D n equals 4 super Yang mills, I think uh, the status of mirror symmetry is not, not well understood. So this is certainly an opportunity where, where, lattice, you know, where lattice techniques can, can, can really uh, give you an advantage over analytical techniques. Well, at least numerical lattice techniques can give you an advantage over approaches. Um, uh, but, but also it would be interesting to incorporate matter multiplets so that you could actually make contact uh, with, with more well understood examples of mirror symmetry. And then, of course, I think another interesting direction uh, would be to, to investigate holography. So, so in fact, uh, uh, people have actually um, proposed um, ADS duels uh, to certain 3dn equals 4 CFTs. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And any further questions for the speaker? Yeah, yeah. you. Um, so, uh, if you, so overall, taking into account this, this additional mass, supersymmetry breaking mass term, uh, Sorry, I couldn't see where the voice was coming from. Yes. Uh, Sorry, so yes. taking into account the supersymmetry breaking mass term, um, you can still do all the tuning at one loop? No, uh, I think in that case it will be up to two loops. Ah, okay. And, but uh, if you would formulate the complete model without the Q-exact formulation, uh, would, 
it would still be possible to do everything at one and two loops. That's that's true. Yes, you're absolutely right. So so in in that in that sense, uh, it's not essential. But uh, well, um, I, I think sort of applying you know using the twisted approach is still beneficial um, because it sort of gives a, a sort of a nice way to formulate the theory and also. Um, it, it sort of ensures, for example, nice properties like like no doubling problem, and 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 things like that. Uh, that's that's not guaranteed. Uh, and these mass terms certainly don't. I think these masks to the twisted theory certainly don't spoil the property. Um, so I think it still benefits uh, to, to sort of thinking about things in, in terms of the twisted approach. But you're right. Uh, you know, if if you you know once you add these mass terms, the Q symmetry is broken, and and you could certainly conceive of uh, of doing things. Uh, Doing things differently. I, oh yeah, the other thing is that that you know a nice thing. An, another nice thing is about the twisted approach is that uh, you know as I said earlier, it, it sort of um, allows you to you know focus on different types of twists. You know, allow Thompson versus Donaldson Witten, and that that you know in in the grand scheme of things may also be interesting uh, when when you start thinking about uh, questions regarding mirror symmetry. Just I wonder. Just wanted to make sure I understand the continuum theory when you you've complexified it. It's non-unitary, is it? Uh non-unitary. I have those complex. Well, okay. So I, I did something a little sneaky. Uh, I put I put in an RE here. <laughs> so I I took the real part of it, uh, which is a little bit artificial uh, because I, I I mean I I put it in there because I wanted the uh, you know I wanted the action. To be real, and and that can be accommodated just just by sort of you know adding the complex conjugate to this term, and then the complex conjugate can be obtained by by uh, defining some Q bar that acts in the complex conjugate way. But but um, I mean it, it may be interesting just you know I mean this I agree this does seem a little bit artificial, and and you know it might be interesting just to sort of look at this theory without without adding in the complex conjugate. Uh, but in that case, indeed, it it would be. Uh, the action wouldn't be real. But if I do that, if I do that, will the Hamiltonian be Q squared, or something, up to constraints? Um, let me see. So, so I, I think I think the answer is that the Hamiltonian would be um, would be zero. Uh, well, no, it would be a Q. It would be Q. Um, no, I'm, I apologize. No, the Hamiltonian would be Q exact, for the same reason that it is in, in 4D n equals two. Uh, so I guess one one of the key properties of of this twisting uh, is that the stress tensor is Q of something, and and that is what allows you to show that that the um, that the uh, partition function, at least when evaluated in appropriate states, is independent of the, of the of the metric. Of the manifold, because what, yeah, so so I think the answer would be is that the Hamiltonian would be Q Q of something. So so when you complexify, I would have imagined you'd also have a a, a second supercharge, right? Yes. Associated with the fact you've now got a complex eta. Yeah. So is that true? Um. Yeah, it's interesting. The the, the way the way I've described it, everything is just written in terms of one. Supercharge, except w when you add in sort of the complex conjugate of this action, then then that's where the Q the Q bar would come in. Uh, but if I if I was focusing on on this, you know, this complex action by itself, I think there's only one one supercharge there. Um, it's an interesting question. Maybe, maybe maybe there's other ways of of thinking about it. So another another small question. You had a U bar in it, but that U bar is no longer the dagger of U. So your mass term needs um, term you wrote down for U doesn't look like it'll do the job. But maybe this real will Well okay. Uh, so 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 yeah I, I I think in fact uh, phi bar is no longer the complex conjugate of phi dagger. But uh, all the other bars are the complex conjugates. So in other words, chi bar is the complex conjugate of phi, u bar is the complex conjugate of u, and uh, eta bar is the complex conjugate of eta. So so it's in fact u bar is is the complex conjugate of u. But but uh, but you were, but the suggestion is that if you were to relax it, uh, what what 
Bar is really the F dagger? Y yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm maybe there's something that I'm missing. I'm I'm just concerned that, for example, this real part. So this is Q of something and Q bar of something. Mm. So the, your Lagrangian is not Q closed. Is that right? Um, it's not Q exact. It's uh, something Q exact plus something Q bar exact. Yes. Uh, should that worry me uh, in the sense that it is not Q closed anymore? Why, why would it be a uh, cause for worry? Uh, because you're telling me that uh, somehow uh, you're telling me that somehow the, the lattice Susie won't uh, won't be preserved um, because you have one part of the Lagrangian, you know, Lagrangian or action which preserves Q, another one, one is Q closed and one is Q bar closed. Yeah. So uh, the sum is closed and they're neither, right? Or is there? Yeah. Am yeah, I, I missing I have something? To think about it. It's a good. It's a good question. I guess it, I, one has to think about uh, what the commutation relation between Q and Q bar is. Even if they anti-commute, you still have a problem, no? Or, or am I um, missing something? I, I'll, let, let me think about that. It's, it's a good question. But let me also say that once I add in these mass terms. The Q invariance is broken anyway. So, uh, in, in that sense, in that sense, uh, from a lattice point of view, um, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much uh, because there are other things that, that definitely. Uh, but that's one term. This would be all the terms. But okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, you see, once once you break one, though, uh, you know, you, you allow uh, any type of. Well, anyway, yeah, it's it's a good question. So, so maybe maybe you're saying that somehow, uh, really, really, this, you know, you you should. Well, if, if that's true, then that would suggest that uh, you really have to think about a complex action somehow, just not, not, in, not add in that, that real part. But, but yeah, let, 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 let me think about it. It's a good question. If you don't take, if you don't take real part, then it's a QE variant that I agree. And then, then if you just add the master, is it the same? Or take real part and add master or just a, don't take real part, but just add mass term. Uh, okay, sorry. So, so you say you if if I didn't take the real part. Yeah, but to still add this mass term. Then yeah. do do you will you end up in the same result? The same result in, in uh, result with or without real part. With with a. Yeah, yeah, but when you say you add, end up with the same result, what, how do you what do you mean by the result? I I mean, uh, do you uh, end up in the same continuum? Limit or same limit oh, limit. oh. Um, That's the case that if you don't take real part, then... Yes, I believe so, because, I mean, essentially what these mass terms are designed to do is, is just um, make, make all, the, uh, all the fields real. So it's just throw away all, all the imaginary stuff. So, so in that case, yeah, I, I think you would end up with the same, the same continuum limit. Sorry, I just uh, made, sim uh, made a simple basic. So, so why, uh, why, why did you the complex by the fields? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Why did you complexify the field? Yeah, the reason. Why did I complexify yeah, yeah. the phi field? I see. Uh, oops. Um, basically, um, for supersymmetric reasons. Uh, so, so when I complexify the other fields, I, I sort of double them. And so, if I double all the fermions, I need to double all the bosons. If I didn't complexify the phi field, then I wouldn't have this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Also for other fields, so yeah, why, yeah, why complex by in, in Oh, class, oh yeah. I see, I see. Uh, well, that's because um, uh, in, in this uh, geometric discretization, well, let's see, what's the right, what's the right uh, one to look at? Ah, yeah, because you see, uh, in, in the geometric discretization approach, uh, fields with, with, with indices mm -hmm. are, are not confined to points. Rather, they, they lie along... Uh, links. And, and once they lie along a link, uh, the gauge transformations of these objects makes them intrinsically complex. If I were to, yeah. You mean, a clo uh, you mean a for, for closing? Uh, yeah, just, just in order for, for, for the gauge symmetry to sort of uh, go through. I see. Just maybe as a quick follow-up on this slide, you note that the gauge transformations are in UN uh, rather than SUN. And I know in 
40, we've had trouble with the U1 sector of that on the lattice that is not constrained by mass terms of the sort you've written down. Is that another complication? That yes. You're yeah, I, I, I think about? that, uh, well, okay. Uh, yeah, you, I mean, some, somehow I guess the point is that this, this U1 uh, is confining and you want to get rid of it. And uh, I think you would, it would be confining and you would want to get rid of it for, as well and for the same reason. Yeah. Okay, so uh, sorry for cutting out this very interesting discussions, but uh, I thank the speaker and all the speaker of the sessions. And